So today I'm going to talk to you about nuclear weapons, specifically about a new class of fusion weapons. And I'm going to introduce this subject by talking about the recent nuclear tests in North Korea and why they're so worrying. Now, an inordinate amount of fuss was made a few months ago by the fact that a nuclear explosion had been detected in North Korea and it was only something like 330 kilotons of TNT equivalent. Now, the reason this is so worrying is that it is an awful lot more difficult to make a tiny nuclear explosion than it is to make a huge one. And this test result points to the fact that North Korea, in fact, has a very, very advanced nuclear capability starting to rear its head. And here we've got a picture of what everyone thinks of when you talk about a fusion bomb. This is the Saar bomber test, Russia's test, of their absolutely huge nuclear weapon. Now, obviously this is a standard fusion type weapon it is pumped by an A-bomb. So there's lots and lots of fallout. The device is radioactive before it's even let off. And um, what you've got is a fusion reaction, which is hydrogen to helium. And the hydrogen has to be doped with a tiny amount of helium to start with, just to give the molecules a hint of where to go and a couple of other gases as well which we won't go into don't want you making one of these in your back garden do we and yeah this is what everyone thinks of but there are other possibilities and this is the actual Tsar bomber device as you can see, it is pretty damn huge. Uh, the two prongs on the front are actually to detect when it hits the ground. Um, and then there's a variable delay, so you can actually let it penetrate a bit uh, before you set the thing off. And as you can see, it is absolutely massive. And this is everyone's picture of fusion weapons, that they are huge. And the reason they're so huge is they have to wrap around a standard A-bomb core, which is itself pretty big. And then around that you have to have a shell which contains highly compressed gas. But the age of these mega-bombs is coming to an end. Why is that? Nobody will use them because of the fallout. If you drop one of these on an enemy, you have rendered that place incapable of uh, use for a minimum of 40 to 50 years, perhaps very much longer if you're worried about the lifetime of your citizens that may be in there. So wouldn't it be lovely if you could actually initiate a fusion reaction without the use of that horrible, nasty, huge A-bomb in the middle of your device. Well, as it turns out, this has been worked on for a large number of years in the civilian world because they're looking at using fusion to generate power. And this is the inside of one of these reactors. It's a tokamak reactor and basically what happens is that around the inside of this wonderfully silvery chamber you have a stream of hot gas plasma now all plasma is is gas that's been heated to an extremely high temperature and compressed a bit now gas like that won't actually fuse what you have to do is hit it with an external energy source you have to hit it with a high-powered laser beam is one of the things they've used. They've also used high-powered radio. Um, 
But the thing is that currently in the civilian world they haven't managed to get one of these reactions to last much longer than a quarter of a second, if that. And the reason why is it tends to spiral out of control. Yeah, they've got a control issue and they don't want a fusion explosion inside their lab. So here's what a tokamak looks like in cutout and immediately you look at it and you say, well, hey, there's no way you could get this into a nuclear weapon. Hell, the damn thing's the size of a building. It would actually be bigger than the Tsar bomber. And the answer to that is no, because the fusion reaction itself is designed in this reactor to be sustained for a long period of time. Nearly everything you see around it is designed to control the reaction, to contain it, and to cool various parts because you don't want your electromagnets burning out, then you lose containments, then there is a big bang, and you lose your lab and a considerable portion of the surrounding city. So strip away all that, and what you have is a very simple thing. What you have is a plasma, which can be generated any number of ways, a small amount of initial compression, and a large energy input. So plasmas, they can be generated in any number of ways. They can be generated electrically. Now, if you uh, have been around your local store recently, gadget shop, you will see these little plasma balls and you have streamers of light that come out and connect to your hands. These are plasmas, okay? They tend to be neon argon type plasmas, not hydrogen helium, but the principle is the same. And there are as many ways of creating plasmas from gases as you can actually shake a stick at. And one of the ways you can do that is by using an explosion. By pumping heat energy and pressure into a gas or a gas mixture, you can create a plasma. Now, all a plasma is, as I've said before, is just heated gas. Gas with a lot of energy in it. And it tends to glow, tends to emit light. So that's a plasma. So we can generate plasma using an explosion, a chemical explosion. Now, surprise, surprise, we can actually generate laser beams using an explosion as well. This diagram comes from a paper which was from a very large test they produced one million joules of laser energy using explosives and um, some iodine and xenon gas. And uh, this principle can also be extended to generating radio waves, to generating x-rays, and all of these would be suitable inputs for turning a plasma into a fusion reaction. And yes, we have the spectre of being able to create fusion devices that are very, very small. Fusion devices which would be indistinguishable from hand grenades. They would produce no radiation except when they are detonated. And this is very important because they would be indetectable. no radiation until they go bang and no fallout so the area is usable immediately after the explosion you can run your troops through it without protective gear an ideal modern warfare weapon
Now here is the sort of damage that could be created by such a thing. This is actually an aerial picture of a car bomb blast, but you're talking about a tonne or so of TNT, and all this damage would be created just from a small hand grenade. Now of course there'd be nothing to stop you making a fusion device of this size using that technology without an A-bomb in it. Nothing at all, but you probably wouldn't want to. Um, and this is one of the reasons why the North Korean tests are a little worrying because if they have worked on this type of fusion and they have the ability to create small indetectable nuclear charges then with someone like Kim Jong-il in charge, it is a very, very worrying prospect. Now, you may say, oh, well, well, such a weapon doesn't actually currently exist. And my answer to you is this. Um, in the civilian sphere, we are making these tokamak reactors for research purposes. And the problem we have with these reactors is not that we can, can't get them to work, they work absolutely fine. The problem is they work too well and the fusion reaction tends to run out of control. The fusion reaction wants to produce an explosion and naturally the scientists don't want this so immediately they see the sign of it going out of control they turn the reactor, reaction off. Now this just says it's very, very easy to make a bomb like that. That's what it says to me. And our government is constantly 20 to 50 years ahead of civilian research and assuming that they haven't managed to make a bomb like this, in my point of view, is just sticking your head in the sand. So. I hope this has given you something to think about and you found it interesting. And if you have, please like, share and of course, subscribe. Thank you very much.